uh, wonderful to see you all, and it uh, seems like we have really wonderful workshops, and you all worked very, very hard the past couple days, so I appreciate you persevering. And you're going to be very glad you did when you hear our closing speaker. Uh, first, I wanted to introduce, though, someone who's been very, very supportive of family-centered and family strength work for many, many years, having run the Triad Family Center program in Houston, and, and now he's the administrator of the Harris County uh, Child Protective Services, and he played a very key role in helping us develop the family camp that you heard about by uh, Dr. Roger Friedman. So let me introduce you to uh, Mr. Joel Levine, who's then going to introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you. Good morning. And first of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Salee for his continued efforts to continue an institute, a conference every year for the past, what is it, about 22 years now? So that's, I think Dr. Salee needs a round of applause for all the work he has done to bring this family preservation, family strength to keep this, keep this going. And I do have the pleasure of introducing Cedric McKenzie, who I had heard two years ago at our, when we had a conference at the Crown Plaza, and you are in for a real treat. And also, Cedric, I just want to say too that he has made heroic efforts to be here today as well. I understand that he has had a long journey from Little Rock, and was in Dallas awake while we were sleeping at three in the morning, and came, he had to drive in from there, so. And, but Cedric has, you know, is an author and motivational speaker. He is the author of She Never Answered, which I believe is for, there's copies available, I believe, out in, out in the lobby, out in the foyer. And he was born in Little Rock, Arkansas. He graduated from the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff with a degree in social work and received his master's in business at Amberton University in Garland, Texas. He has worked for the United States government for the past 22 years, currently employed with the Social Security Administration Regional Office in Dallas. Cedric is a life member of Kappa Alpha PSI Fraternity Incorporated and has served on the board of directors of the Dallas alumni of Kappa Alpha Leaguers. Uh, sorry, Kappa Alpha PSI Fraternity. And Cedric worked with numerous groups, including mentoring to the young men of Kappa. And he has a dedicated his life to inspire foster children and provide a window of opportunity and hope as a longtime advocate, speaker at conferences, and seminars throughout the country on their behalf. So I introduce Cedric McKenzie. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. And good morning. good morning. I am so happy to be here. Very tired, but I am very happy to be here. Um, my friend Alvin uh, called me several times and, where are you? Are you coming? I said, yes, I'm coming. <laughs> I'm, I'm stuck somewhere with my job in another city, but I was able to make it and I really uh, Appreciate Alvin. I've been knowing Alvin for the last 12 years, and I have participated in every one of his conference every year. Um, and I look at Alvin as one of my mentors because Alvin was the gentleman that told me, hey, you need to write a book. And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He told me this 12 years ago. And I said, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. I get to it, I get to it. He said, if you need some help, you want me to edit it for you, I'll help you out. And so I'm here really just to give you some encouragement as far as why you are here, why you chose to do what you do, why you chose to major in social work, why you chose to work for Child Protective Services, and why you chose to work with children. Um, we all need mentors. We always need someone to, to pat us on our back and give us a boost, because I know what social workers make. You know, I, I graduated with a social work, degree, social work degree in Arkansas, but it was not about the money for me, it was about what had happened to me, that I wanted to make a difference for those kids who are going through the same circumstances. Now, so you can revisit why you've been here all week. You went to different sessions about families, why families are important to children, 
biological families, adoptive families, foster families. Avon was a part of preservation at uh, New Mexico State University. And I feel today, and I know today, why preservation would have been important to me. Why it would have made a difference for that little bitty boy who was stuck in a situation that he had no control. Now, you understand a child is innocent, correct? It means they, they believe in you, okay? You have the vehicle to success for that child. And as I was saying earlier, you have to have mentors, someone to give you some guidance to where you are now. There were some people that were very vital for me in my life, uh, the way I grew up and how I ended where I ended in life despair because I had no directions. But when I look back at where I came, back, came from, where I am today, I'm very humble and thankful because I could have been that kid that could have been robbing you, having sex with you, or murdering you because of circumstances that I was under. Now, success is nice. It's nice to make money and to wear a suit every day to look good. I've been with the United States government for the last 22 years, and it was not something easy just to say I got to the United States government and I do well in life because it was not like that. And most people that see me every day, they say, oh, he's a nice looking guy. He's doing well in life. He's good. But it's, it has not always been like that. And so, so often we like to judge people for who they are. He's a little cocky. He thinks he's all that. But you never know where, where a person came from. You don't know what they dealt with in their past, in their life. But when I think about I wrote that book, she never answered. It took me 15 years to put that story together. With the help of Alvin 12 years ago, I thought about, yeah, I think I need to write it. But I would have never thought the difference that my book would have made to those kids who went through the same thing, who was going through the same things that I went through. Because I was so, I didn't want to recall all the events that had happened to me. Sitting down for nine consecutive months and writing a book about what you dealt with, what you went through in your life was very, very hectic for me. Now, I had to recall things from what they call the records, case file, and put things in perspective of putting a book together. Many nights I cried, many days I cried. Went to sleep, woke back up with the same bad feeling because I had to recall everything. But I knew I had to write that book because so many people in my pathway of success are people that helped me along the way, such as Bill Clinton the former president who took time out to give me opportunity to attend college when the state of Arkansas welfare system said no. And what about that last foster mother, my mother, O.Z. Lampkins, who was that person that took me in as a last resort because the state was gonna send me to an institution. And she said, I'll take him. I don't know anything about him. I just know what y'all told me about him. But I will take him. If she would have never gave me an opportunity to be in her household, I definitely would be here today. Because that was the last foster mother uh, that took, took opportunity with me. And she was the last mother that I still continue to talk with. What happened way back 1966 can affect a child who is a grown man today. Now, if I cry, that's because I'm recalling some things from the past. You have to take your job very, very, very serious of what you do for a child. Because a child remembers everything you say to them, right or wrong. I remember, I'm 44 years old. I believe 
that the care that preservations could have gave my mother would have gave her an opportunity to, to take care of me where I could have had opportunity to live with my brothers and my sisters. I have three brothers and a sister. My mother was 21 years old when she had me. 1960s in Arkansas was pretty rough for African-American woman who already had one child who was four years old with family members assisting her. If family preservations could have came in and set my mother down to talk with her about our circumstances, asked her, what do you need? What, what resources do you need from us? Because the ultimate goal, as you know, is to keep that family together, regardless of what the circumstances were. My mother was just young, with no job. But she was pregnant, and here comes me, that innocent, little boy. I was an in, look at me, I, you know, I don't have hair on my head now, but look at me. I had hair. But I'm an innocent little boy laying in that hospital room, wondering, where is my mother? My mother made a decision that I just don't like most women that have problems with taking care of their kids, that they just leave their child in the hospital. That's what my mother decided to do. She walked away from me from the hospital at six days old. And I believe if a preservation caseworker would have been there with her at that hospital, or even a social worker, a good social worker, I believe my mother would have had a second thought of walking away from her little boy. There was a social worker that was there who tried to talk to my mother, give her opportunity to change her mind but that did not work. Baby boy was born November the 7th, 1966 at 2.54 p.m. I'm sure a lot of you students, I'm old enough to be your daddy, right? <laughs> Read that. With Miss Crabtree, would she would ever thought that Cedric McKenzie would have had that information? about what happened to him when he was born at 2.54 p.m. So you gotta be very careful, students, caseworkers, case managers, what you document, how you document information regarding a child. Because when a child attained a certain age, as 18, that child can request their records. And there's been a variety of lawsuits against systems because the way they documented, the way they treated children. My mother decided she signed a consent form. She signed a consent form, meaning that she decided, I don't want the child, you're now in the state's custody. The state decided that this child is gonna be adopted, but that never happened. I was never adopted, even if I was a candidate for adoption. A child, is in, a child gets in a situation, a child is given away from the mother, now he's a candidate for adoption. Now, I've sp I spoken with CASA, and when you're looking at preservations, they kind of work conjointly together. I think that would have happened as far as me getting adopted. Because that caseworker did not do his job as adoption specialist. Because he never implemented the court order to get this child adopted. But in the meantime, the social worker is still trying to work with my mother. Now, what, would you, what do you think my mother was thinking during that time that she knows she has one child and she gave away a very little handsome little boy? What was she thinking about? And I'm sure you, you ladies in here and gentlemen, gentlemen, men, man, men, yeah. I know that if some of you have children, you know what effects it is for you to be around your child. You watch the child walk, you watch the child call your name, you know everything about that child that you love your child. I wonder what was my mother thinking during that, the duration when I was stuck in this foster home. Now the foster home they put me in temporarily was a foster home for disabled and handicapped children. My foster mother was a 60, 
five-year-old lady who only accepted disabled, handicapped children. Y'all know what disabled, handicapped children are, right? These are, these are children who cannot function on their own. They have to have guidance for whatever they do and how they do it. So I was placed in this home temporarily, meaning that I was going to be adopted, that I was going to find that family who was going to love me. Regardless if they was white, white, black, Hispanic, it didn't matter. I was going to be adopted, and there was a court order there. I had an uncle who wanted to assist my mother. My great uncle wanted to assist my mother. With, no, my grandfather wanted to assist my mother and my grandfather's son, which was my uncle, wanted to assist my mother. My mother had a sister in California who wanted to assist her with me. But the state said, no, she has already signed her consent form. He is now in our care. I'm sorry. Now, I have those pictures because my siblings are dead, so those are my pictures. I can show you those pictures. Those are my brothers and sisters. That is me on the right. I didn't know anything about my surroundings, only to know that those are my, that is my family, my brothers and my sister, sisters. When a kid is placed in a foster home, there's a certain type of protocol that they follow as far as the mother giving them food, making sure that they are taken care of. Now remember, I suppose we only been here temporarily in this home. Now case workers and case managers, when you go out there working with children, make certain that you know what's going on with that child at all times. This is a choice that you made to accept a job as a social worker, to go to college as, to be a social worker because the workload is heavy. The money is less than, but that's a choice that you made. That child is in your hands, meaning that their love, their, 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 their wealth, well-being is in your care. That's my brother on my left. In my book, I call him Junior, Jeff, but his name is Junior. G Jr., I can't tell you his real name. And those are my other three brothers, and that is my two sisters. The older sister, it's a sister I used to watch get raped all the time as I was growing up as a foster child. I was six years old when I witnessed her being raped by Mr. Pert in my book, who was the gentleman who took care of things for my mother foster mother. He was the handyman for my foster mother. Why should children see things that they don't understand, but only see them on TV? You only see things on television that happens, but in reality when it happens, it, it gives you a reality check about, wow, why is this happening? We had no control of the situation. Who are we going to tell? The social worker? Is she going to believe us? And where was my foster mother when all these things was going on in that household? She was nowhere to be found. Every child deserves a chance to have an adequate lifestyle of learning, education, the welfare of health, meaning that they should be able to get nice clothing, take a nice bath, and be able to go to school, come back home, hug and kiss their family, regardless if it's the foster family, regardless if it's an adoption family. Someone to love that child. I never had that growing up. It was always I was a different child who was possibly white. You know, remember my brothers and sisters were disabled and handicapped, so they could not function for themselves but I was a normal child who could. So things that I saw affected me because the reality of how I felt as a child and what I saw. My brothers and sisters couldn't feel it because they needed assistance. So when my sisters got, when my sisters got raped over and over and over, over again, because it was a repetitive process, what does a social worker do when those things happen? And what do you do as a social worker? when those situations happen. 
what kind of, in the social work trying to call it a method of intervention. How did you intervene? How can, how can you come in and intervene a situation that will lead to destruction for a child who is innocent? I saw things when I was growing up, electric company, zoom, zoom, zoom on, zoom, Pinocchio. I saw all those things, the Bozo Show. I saw all of that stuff. Six Million Dollar Man, The Long Ranger. Y'all don't know nothing about that. Y'all was too young to know anything about that, right? W.W. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Wrestling. The Lawrence Welch Show. Those are the things that I can recall from the past of what I dealt with going through a foster care home. And I'm 40 something years old. I remember every day and everything that effectively happened to me in a good way and definitely in a bad way. And I don't think children should go through those type of things if they're innocent. They didn't do anything wrong. They were just born. If a mother or father decides to look the other way for it from a child, it's on, on that child's behalf, it's your responsibility as that worker, as that advocate for that child to make a difference for that child and give them that love and that respect. In school, people looked at me as an orphan kid. They said, whoa, he don't have a mom and daddy. That old lady who was my mother I always told people she was my grandmother because I did not want to get embarrassed. Can you imagine walking to school with a six foot old looking lady with a wig to the first grade from three blocks from her house, three blocks from the school, three blocks from her house, all the way up the street to the schoolhouse and dropped you off at the front door. How do you think I felt as a little kid? Second grade, I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything about education, only what I saw on TV. I did not get the education from my foster mother because she only had a second grade education. I got put back in the second grade because I was not ready to be promoted to the third grade. People in my surroundings knew that I was different. They called me a retarded boy because when my foster mother and the handyman, Mr. Pert, we go to the grocery store, everybody get in the car together. So we get in the car together, what do people think about that child? And I was treated that way in school. The principal, the teachers, the counselors do my circumstances. They treated me upon my circumstances. He's a foster child, he's a slow learner. We're gonna put him in the special education classes. Why? Why? Me. What did I do wrong? Third grade, fourth grade. Where was the social workers doing these circumstances? Cedric is now in the third grade and he's a slow learner. But I feel that we are neglecting his welfare as a child because we decided to look the other way. It's too late right now, I think, at this point to get him adopted. We'll just monitor to see where he goes from here. So now you got a social worker who made an assessment of me and my well-being that there's a problem here. I have the records to prove it. Do you think that social worker who put her name or his name in my file want to see me now? Be very careful what you document regarding the child. Cedric has behavior problems. Why would I not? Because when I found out that old woman who I thought was my mother, because I did not know, and I really was a slow learner, I did not know that woman was not my mother until she called us a bastard, me and my brother, in the, in the shirt. She called her a bastard. I try my best to take care of you guys, and y'all don't appreciate anything. And my eyes was awakened. This woman ain't my mother. Where, who is my mother? Where did I come from? So children's wonder where they come from. This week you learned about family, the family values and neglect and abuse and what, how families should come together and how families, how the strength of a family. You know, University of Houston downtown centers for family strengths, right? Symposium. That's what you're here for. 
you're going to make sure that no one end up like me. And through the trials and tribulations that I went through. And make note, every child will not be strong enough to beat the odds of despair. I did because someone was watching over me. I don't know why, but someone was watching over me. When I, talk, when I say I got beat down by my foster mother over and over again because I got smarter, because I knew something was not right. She wasn't my mother anyway. Why should I listen to her? When I went to the social worker and told the social worker, hey, mama is not really my mama. Who is my mama? Oh, she's your mother. She's taking care of you. No, she's not. She's not my mother. Then I got more and more rebellious because that social worker was lying to me and I, I did not trust that social worker. I only saw that social worker when I did something wrong. Don't do that. Every now and then call, hey Jeff, you did good and I'm glad you're doing good in school. Is there anything that you need? That's the social worker I wish I had. And looking at family preservation, can you imagine? I would have never got beat up I would have never been treated the way I was treated. I would have never been judged the wrong way. Where was my mother? Oh, they lost contact about my mother. They no longer knew where my mother was. They continue to document, we are putting him in a disadvantage because if we continue to leave him in this household, most likely he will end up like the other children in the household. Does that make you mad? You got these professional social workers with a degree saying, if we continue to leave him in this household, he's most likely gonna end up like these other kids. I try to go to my supervisor, the social worker saying, and say, hey, what are we gonna do for him? I ain't got time to listen to you about him. He's okay. Leave him where he's at. How's my development going on during this time? Fifth grade, sixth grade. Remember, I flunked in the second grade. I'm 12 years old now. I, didn't never, I never got the bike that I always dreamed. The Tonka truck when I was little, I never got to go to the uh, wrestling matches that I saw on TV, to even go to the Bozo show when I saw Bozo, to even think about getting to Gillen's Island and the Griffin show. I always fantasize about things that can, I can escape from my circumstances and my surroundings. Can I run away? Yes, I can, and I did. I ran away from my foster home for several days. Ain't know where I was because I want to live the dream that I always saw on television. But when I showed back up three or four days later, I got my butt beat down by my foster mother because they had to call the police looking for me. And guess what? I learned a lot of things on the streets. You know, kids do learn a lot of things in the streets, what they see on television, because if the mama, my foster mother's not paying attention to me, the social worker lying to me, who am I going to turn to? I'm gonna to turn to whoever is gonna give me what I want, attention. So I started listening to my friends and my neighborhood. My neighborhood was prostitutes, two doors down. The young fine woman, a door down from her. And then the dope house. We call it a dope house, it means a drug house. Two prostitutes that I knew, they used to always give me candy or give me money, go get candy. The two pimps that I used to see all the time, I thought they were just cool dudes with big hats and big old shoes. I ain't know who they were. But those same prostitutes that used to give me candy that was pretty and fine was the same two prostitutes. I saw their body naked where body over here, head over here. Do kids need to witness that? And the little fine woman, the door, a couple doors down from the prostitute house, that was my first girlfriend at age 12. 
body parts do work for 12 year old males. Men went in, men went out. Men went in, men went out. She taught me what sex was about. I saw what Mr. Pert did, the man in my household who was the handyman. But I want to know what does it feel like to be with a woman? And I found out. And I liked it. And I kept going and going and going. She dropped me one day. She said, I've taught you the things that I've taught you. Now you go find you a girlfriend. Should a 12 year old be doing some things like that? I did. Then I started doing things in the streets, like stealing in 7 Eleven stores, but never got caught. Well, I'll tell you about that in a minute. Stealing in 7 Eleven stores, acting up in school, being very destructive about I didn't care because that woman was not my mother. Social worker started a document, he's a psychological problem now. I'm afraid that Cedric is going to end up in jail. Why would I not? I'm in the same household that I was in that I was six days old. Where was the social worker? Where was that adoption specialist who promised my mother that I was going to be adopted? Family preservations would not have made that, would not have let that happen to me, but it did. I used to go to the skate arena. I got beat up several times. I suffered a concussion in the hospital. I went to the hospital because my friends that I hung out with, it was five of us. They were gang members. You know what gang members are? Back in those days, we had gang members. That was when people were afraid of you. And everybody in school knew who the troublemakers were. When I attended the seventh grade, there was a coach named Coach Stanley Williams who tried to reach out to me to help me because he knew my circumstance. Like I said, in school, they know, social workers do visit the school and say, I'm a Cedric social worker, and he's a foster child, uh, he's, he's got problems, he's very destructive, uh, you need to watch him. When he's act up, call the police and call me. Can you imagine, seventh grade, junior high school, people scared of me, even in eighth grade. Scared of me. And look at me in the ninth grade. Would you be scared of me? Would you be scared of me? That was a, that, that innocent little boy to a destructive looking young man. I didn't care. So they sent me to this licensed social worker who um, he said, we're going to give you some counseling because, you know, if you don't Go to this council, we're gonna have to send you to the state hospital because you got psychological problems, boy. Do I look like I ever had psychological problems? Do I? I did. Because no one loved me, no one cared about me. My life was threatened many times in junior high school. In eighth grade, a gentleman came and put the gun to my head because we had a fight at the skating ring. But the fool forgot to take the safety latch. He forgot to remove the safety latch when he pulled the trigger. I got thrown in the hospital again, fighting at the skating rink. That's why I wanted to have my good time. Sunday night, soul night. Wednesday night, soul night. Saturday day was family day, and I didn't want to go on family day. I wanted to be with my friends, my girls, the guys, because I wanted to kick it, because I didn't care. I already knew that I was going to be a game banger and I was going to do whatever it took because no one cared about me anyway. That old lady who was my foster mother for those many years was really scared for my safety. And so much that I was removed from that foster home in July of 1983. I can remember dates of everything that happened to me in the past. We don't have any time to talk about it today because I mean, we only have an hour and 15 minutes, an hour and a half. But going through that situation probably was the best thing that could have ever happened to me at that point in my life was to get kicked out of that foster home because my life would have ended a couple weeks later because I stole the TV from my foster mother, sold it to this gentleman at Mexico, Chiquita, and I had to go back and steal it back from him to return it back to my foster mother. 
and he was looking for me. But they sent me to Pine Bluff, Arkansas, meaning I left Little Rock, went to Pine Bluff. Now, a child's circumstances can probably be better if you just really watch. If the mother is a very abusive, neglect mother, move, move that child out of the house and take them somewhere else so they can start a new life. Wouldn't you agree? I moved from Little Rock to Pine Bluff, which was the best thing that could have ever happened to me. Even the good things that happened to me being in sports. I was on a basketball team, football team, and ran cross country. And I ran cross country and I ran track because all somebody was always running after me for stuff I was into. I was a good athlete. There was a potential for me doing well in life, running. The game members, when we fight each other, we run. You gotta get away. So they put me in sports. They say, if he can run, he can play basketball. If he can run, he can run track. If he can run, he definitely can play football. I did all of that. Then I transferred that over to Pine Bluff High School. I, like I got a, a, a wig on on it. <laughs> That's my hair, y'all. That's my hair. I played music. I played five different instruments because I like music. Pine Bluff was an experience that I've never experienced before ever growing up. The educational standpoint is I started studying in the 10th grade. Remember, my foster mother didn't know anything. The counselors thought I was retarded anyway, right? Is a child gonna be successful starting to study classroom work in the 10th grade? Social workers documented he has an educational deficiency, a learning deficiency. He's all, he can't learn anything. I played football. I was in a new environment and I met new people. But I was in a youth home because there was nowhere where for me to go. No families wanted a 16-year-old foster child who had a record like I had. So where were they going to put me? They put me in an institution. But there was a social worker who dropped me off at the door. And she said, I'll come back and get you. What do you want? I said, I want a family. I don't care if they're white or black. Because I know I'm 16. In a couple of years, they're going to kick me out based on my record with the system. Even though I was thrown out of that foster home, I was hurt. And I was scared because that's all I knew was that old woman and my brothers and sisters. Now get this, what happened to disabled children when they're placed in foster homes and then when they age out? What happened to them? My foster mother had several children who aged out of foster care. She kept them, meaning they got social security disability. She was their guardian now. The state said, sure, you can have them. Now I'm gonna get to another point on that. What happened to them if something happens to that parent? If that parent dies, where do those kids go then? When the state said, ah, she's in your care, your guardian, you got them, these are your children. Pine Bluff, was a nice school for me because I was no longer hanging out with those bad friends of mine. There was an opportunity for someone to give me some guidance. It was a counselor who told me I had two choices in life, to be what they said I was gonna happen, was, that was gonna happen to me or be successful by doing the things that I needed to do. A counselor and a social worker. There was a freshman social worker in her first year who told me about my case file, who told me when you turn 18, no, before you turn 18, request your records, and when you read them, sue us, because you're gonna find what happened to you. You know, there's been a lot of different lawsuits with, against the system, do you think? Neglect of a child's welfare, and it's documented. 
I graduated from that youth home 13 months. So they sent me to another foster home. I got kicked out of that foster home because I stayed out late with some women. So they sent me to another foster home. I stayed at a lady's house late at night and fell asleep. And my stuff was waiting for me in the front of the door. I got kicked out of that foster home. So they sent me to another place, a temporary place, to a family who was going to, you know, they were going to a transition of being foster parents. They didn't want me because I went to school with their, with their daughter and son, and they knew, no, nah, we don't want to deal with Cedric. Then it was that last foster mother, O.Z. Lampkins, who took opportunity to say, I'll take him. Now, I didn't find this out until like three years ago about what she did for me. Every so often, you have to do a little extra for a kid, even when you are limited of doing that. This woman said, I will take him, regardless of what he did in the past. Regardless how y'all say he's a terrible kid, I will take him. That was the best thing that could ever happen to me. Someone who finally loved me. Can you imagine a kid finally being loved by a woman in 11th grade? I love you for who you are, Cedric. I don't know too much about your past. I really don't care. I'm going to respect you for who you are as a little man. Respect me as your mother. O.Z. Lampkin said this to me in 11th grade. I finally loved a woman. A woman loved me. Still in the back of my mind, who is my family? Where are they? When I graduated from high school, there was no social workers there, there was no administrators there. O.Z. Lampkins was there, and my coach, Stanley Williams, I told you earlier, was there. Where, where was I gonna go? I wanted to go to college, and I flew out to San Diego, California, and the state said, well, since you're going out to California, you no longer not care. I had 30 days to get back to Arkansas. Because when I went out to California, they lied to me about my music, that I, my scholarship. They lied to me. So I ended up back in Arkansas. And when I ended up back in Arkansas, they told me, you left. School is already in session. Now, if I don't go to college, what would happen to Cedric? He's going to get kicked out of the system because if I'm not in college, you can't get any care. So what did I have to do? And I did the unrealistic thing that anybody would ever thought that I would ever did in my life. I went to see Bill Clinton in Governor of Arkansas. He's, he's Governor of Arkansas, that means he's my daddy. I'm a state kid. <laughs> I'm a state kid, he's a Governor of Arkansas, that means he's my father, I need some help. Daddy, I need some help. What is that you want, Cedric? All I want to do is go to college. But the state told me that I can't go. And you know they did their little research because they want to figure out He's a foster child, and all he wants to do is go to college. Listen. Sometimes you got to listen to what a kid says to you, even when you don't believe them. Because every so often, what they say may be true. Even if they're telling a lie, just respond to them, yes, no, yes, no. Go the extra mile with them. I was on my way to Henderson State University in my raggedy Chevette that my foster mother helped me buy. No air, nothing. I was going to college. And I was going to be like every, everybody else. Can you imagine this little bitty boy left at the hospital six days old, now going to college? Can you imagine the excitement that I graduated from high school? I'm going to college. Didn't think I could make it in college, but I was going. From the governor of Arkansas. 
who looked at me as any other child who needed help. I showed up on campus with my backpack. Nobody knew anything about me. They didn't know anything that I was a foster child. Who cares? I'm in college now. I started watching what every student did. They read a book. I read my book. They ran for student government office. I did too. They applied for a credit card. I did too. <laughs> we stayed out late at night. I did too. We got drunk. I did too. Because I was now a college student. Bill Clinton told me one thing. He's always, he always said, now if you get to college, make sure you get to college and do well. And hopefully you'll graduate and you can tell somebody about your experience. Remember I talked about that youth home that I was in, that I graduated from? I went to a 25th anniversary of the Southeast Arkansas Mental Health Banquet where Bill Clinton spoke. We both like men coming out of the restroom together, you know, like, what's up, you know, good to see you again. He said, Cedric, I'm glad you are doing well. Keep up the good work. That's all a kid wanted to hear. Because it gave me inspiration. It gave me a little pep in my step that, you know what? The governor of Arkansas, foster mother, and a social worker, they believe in me. They believed me so well that I was the vice president of student government at the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff, the acting president the semester that Bill Clinton ran for president. Can you imagine that? Look at the whole picture. How many kids in those circumstances are going to be successful to that point to go to college and to graduate from college? with honors. Remember I was that child that was slow and who was mild retarded, they say. Where am I now? I graduated from college and got recruited with, I got recruited by the United States federal government. Can you imagine me? The thug, the gang member, got recruited by the United States government. Now, you're probably wondering, how did you get a job with the government and you was a thug? It's because I did not get caught like my friends. <laughs> Either I got there a day before they got caught or the day after. Okay, I didn't get caught. I did it, but I didn't get caught. So when they ran my background, my background check, they said, we gotta ask you a question. They said, you was a foster child. I see we, you, we, you have some state records here. I said, yeah, I was a foster child. Where's your mother, father? I don't know. So what makes you think we should hire you over anyone else? I said, well, the only thing I can say is you'll get someone with determination who will stick to what he needs to do and who will be effective for what he does from the beginning and to the end. That's what I can do. And I got hired and I've been there ever since, 22 years. I still wanna know who my family was. I was pissed. I mean, that, that was a bad way to say it. I was mad. <laughs> I was upset. I graduated from college. I got these records in my hand telling me who my family was and I couldn't find anyone or nobody. I said, you know what? I'm gonna tell the story to whoever asked me about my circumstances or where I've been. I'm at work, the newspaper wanna know, how did you graduate from college? You was a foster child? Tell us about your story. I said, I ain't got no family because the state took my family away from me. And looking back, reading what preservation is, family preservation, can you imagine I would have had a family? Some mother, some father, someone, even if my mother decided she wanted to walk away, someone would have been there to help me, to nurture me. 
making a difference for those who need support, who need love. And that's what you have to do. Love, support to get them to that next level. I, they want to know, I want to let them know, hey, y'all can't continue doing that to these kids. See, those kids are innocent and they should not have to suffer situations that they have no control of. Why? Why should a child go through that over and over again? Read that, what people may say. A child's self-concept. As I entered the foster home, Who did I encounter with? The social worker? From the social worker to the foster mother. From the foster mother to my environment. If the social worker told me that, she gonna do th that things was gonna happen for me and I was gonna do well, but they never happened. If that foster mother was gonna be the one to save me, to take care of me, to love me as if I was her own child. And we, when you're working with children, don't call them foster child or adopted child. Just call them their name. Jeff, David, Mary, Sarah. Don't say this is the foster child case number 701-537. No. Let that child be identified by their name. Y'all remember the Oklahoma bombing? I remember the Oklahoma bombing? I had a friend who died in the Oklahoma bombing and I went to his funeral and I saw this pretty lady. She was beautiful. Let them kids know their family. Let them know who their brother, their sisters, their cousins, because that lady that I ran into was my cousin at the funeral, my natural cousin. I could have been dating her. We exchanged phone numbers. We went to the same church. She sang in the choir, I sang in the choir. We said, you know what? We need to get together. And she saw my last name was McKenzie. Now my mother spelled my last name M-C-K-E-N-Z-I-E, but my name is really spelled M-C-K-I-N-Z-I-E because her mother is my mother's aunt, which is my great aunt. And she said, I need you to talk to somebody. And can you imagine, out of all those years, looking for my family, a friend died. I met a lady at a funeral who ended up being my natural cousin. Will every child get to the point of their life to be successful like that? Then I started meeting my second cousin, my third, my fourth, fifth, eight, nine, ten cousins, my great aunt, my uncle. Can you imagine how I felt out of all these years of being all by myself, I finally found someone who was my family. The cousin on the far right is who I was going to date. The cousin in the middle I went to college with, she played at the university basketball team. I finally went to a family reunion. I didn't even know what it was to be around so many people who looked like me. My, bro my mother had seven brothers and six sisters. And I met every one of them. Even the aunt I met in California when I took a visit to visit her, she knew what had happened of why my mother made the decision that she made. But that's her sister. She said, I'm glad you're doing well. Keep in contact with me. I was okay at this point. Even though they made me mad, I still had to be the advocate that I am today. They needed my help. We need more kids to be adopted take it out of foster homes with some kind of family that's gonna support them and give them the love that they need rather than being in a foster home. Now, foster home, to me, a foster home is supposed to be a temporary place until we can get you, get you to your final destination. When you think that, not stay there 
for 16 and a half years until you get kicked out. And my uncle Roosevelt told me, you got three brothers and a sister. Out of all three of your brothers and one of your sisters, I think you, is there only gonna be one brother that you're gonna, have, you're gonna spend time with. And that brother that he was talking about was my brother Reggie, who was in where? The pen. And that's my nephew in the middle. Do we got any resemblance there? That's my brother. That's my cousin, who I went to college with. That's my brother's daughter, which is my niece. I'm still trying to learn my family at age 44. Family preservations would have never, ever separated family. I was separated from my family for so many years because what happened way back then affects me now as a 44-year-old. I called my mother when I found out who she was. Ring, ring, the telephone ring, ring, ring. I was so nervous. Shh. Hello. Hi, this is Cedric. I just want to let you know I'm your son and I'm doing okay. Cedric, click. Uncle Roosevelt said, I told you, your mama got issues. Go try again. I called the next day, ring, ring, ring. Telephone rang again, I was still nervous. I just said, Lord, please let my mom just say, it's okay. Just let her talk to me. Can you imagine a grown man praying just so he could have a conversation with his mother? Have you ever seen no kids cry when they can't even have a conversation with their mother and father? Can you imagine that? Ring, ring, the telephone rang again. My mother answered the phone, hello. I said, this is Cedric. I know you a maniac on the loose trying to destroy my family. If you continue to call me, I will call the police. Click. That's the last time I talked to my mother or even spoke to her. What happened way back then can affect you what's going on now. I got a relationship with my niece and my nephew, Reggie. Remember Reggie, you saw him in the middle of the picture when my brother was in the prison. He's now this love, joy, handsome singer. I have a relationship with Reggie. I have a relationship with Reggie, my son, and my brother. My nephew and my niece has a relationship with my mother, who is their grandmother. But my nephew and my niece can't tell my mother that they have a relationship with me. Reggie has a relationship with everyone on that picture, including his niece. But he decided that he no longer was going to have a relationship with my mother because he wanted to have a relationship with his <coughs> brother. What happened way back when can affect what's going on now. And today, I still don't have a relationship with my mother. I still don't talk to her because that's the choice that she made. Should I stop doing what I'm doing as a man to be, and to do something for someone else to be successful? It hurts. It always hurt. You watch television. You go to church. You see these families together. That's grandmother. I have a daughter and I have a son. They can't even see their grandmother. Can you imagine how that feels? I believe preservation would have been there for me. I don't know what the circumstances of why my mother did what she did. It just happened. If you want to read a book that's detailed and talks about what someone really goes through from the beginning to the end, Pick your copy up today. But if you don't, just remember this. Read there, whatever your role is, one of a birth parent, social worker, or foster parent, 
Please heed the gentle warning of a foster child in spite of what people said and because of God succeeded, for not all foster children will be able to overcome the impact of people who say things that have negative results. Why gamble with a child's life? Let us renew our commitment to foster children by continuously speaking words of encouragement into their lives. You're not gonna find it on Google, that's something that I wrote. And my book was written by Cedric, not a ghostwriter, but by Cedric. Now, I talk to foster children all the time because they're my friends. And Joel was telling me about another one of my friends, Tyrone, who graduated from Texas A&M Commerce when I did the PALS conference. You know when you're signing a book, kids, hey man, you know, I'm gonna graduate from college, I'm, I'm gonna do this and this, can I call you sometime? Even though I was busy, I still heard what he said, can I call you sometime? And if I call you, will you answer your phone and talk to me? Yeah, 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 call me, man, I'm gonna talk to you. Call me. Tyrone called me, he lives in Houston now. He calls me. He fell into a couple circumstances, but he remembered what I said to him. Call me if you need to talk to me. And Joel said today, I need you to talk to Tyrone. Do you remember Tyrone? I said, yes, I remember Tyrone because I have kept in contact with Tyrone because I understand Tyrone's circumstances. He's trying to get to the level that he's always dreamed of being at. Why would I not help him? And I always tell foster kids, girls and guys, because, you know, I'm thankful. You know, I'm really thankful. Do y'all believe me now? I'm very, very thankful for who I am. And I always tell them, when I was driving up here, went to Little Rock, then went from Little Rock, went to Dallas, took a shower, put on some clothes. It was dark when I got to Dallas. It was dark when I left to come here. And I saw the sun come up as I was going down the highway. You gotta always remember, as I tell foster children, Dad, you and I are mighty kings and queens sent from God above. That's who brought us here, God above. The tears, the pain, doesn't matter anymore because we understand our purpose and what our mission is going to be in life. Early in the morning when you wake up, like I said, I saw those dark to light, but early in the morning, if you're at home, wherever you may be, the dorm room, at home, shelter, I don't know. When you wake up, get dressed, and before you leave to your destination, pull the shades back, or the courage, the blinds, whatever you may have, and look outside, what do you see? You see the bright sun shining upon your face. The wind blowing, you smiling, everything's gonna be all right. The birds are flying high, that's you and I, because no one can touch us now. Continue flying and keep moving fast. Don't make a detour and look at life's despair, what you dealt with in the past. Continue moving forward. Keep flying, but every now and then land in a tree. Recall all the things that you have accomplished as that chosen one. Continue smiling, looking at your enemies and the people that was against you who thought you wouldn't be successful. Smile, continue flying, and once you land into your destination, go back home. It's dark now. The sun is not out. But I still see clear sky. So when you walk in that dorm room, that shelter, or that house, or wherever you may be, Make sure you close those curtains. And when you close those curtains, before you close those curtains, just look, look out again. What do you see now? You see those stars that are sprinkling so bright. That signifies God has a smile on your face. He was with you today, tomorrow, and forever. Your dreams will come true. At the end of a thunderstorm, there's always a rainbow on the other side, signify a brand new day. Thank you, folks, for bringing me here.